Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salati wa salam ala rasulina Muhammad Alameen Wa na'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi Rahman Rahim Thanks for joining again uh, with regard to these sessions that are discussing the counter-narrative proposed or put forward by Javed Ahmed Ghamadi uh, in primarily in his article that he wrote uh, titled Islam in the State, a counter-narrative. The subsequent le lectures he delivered, known as the Dallas lectures, that were delivered both in Dallas and uh, actually in Malaysia, that expounded on his, the ideas within this counter-narrative that he put forward. Up to this point, uh, we have been discussing the 10 key points that he raises as part of his counter-narrative. And so far, we've gone through three of the points, and, and in the last session, we ended up discussing this idea, which he says uh, is quite common in the Muslim community. The idea that uh, as part of the traditional narrative or arising out of that, that Islam is not simply a religion, but Islam is a nationality. And Ramdi rejects this idea. And he rejects it primarily uh, on the basis that there's no sort of religious justification for this. There's nothing within the sources of Islam, within the Quran, within the Sunnah, the, the key sources of Islam, uh, or if some might say the constitutional sources of Islam, that suggests that Islam is a nationality and not simply a religion. Right? And so what he does talk about is that in the Quran, the relationship between Muslim required to be one where they are a single nation, a single nationality. Rather, the idea is that they are a brotherhood. They have a relationship, a brother fraternal uh, relationship uh, amongst each other which is despite or transcends the various nationalities they have. It doesn't mean that it rejects those nationalities. It doesn't mean that those identities don't exist or can't exist or aren't allowed to exist. But rather, the relationship takes those identities into account. And despite those differences, says that there is a brotherhood between Muslims that's premised on faith. So that was the last point that we had discussed. Now, in the fourth point, Ramdi moves into another discussion. And for the fourth point, he says, this year is centering on the idea of how we understand who is Muslim, who is non-Muslim, who's a believer, who's a non-believer. What should our perspective be on this? And the main question here, or the main sort of idea that's animating Ramdi's discussion is this notion. Do we have the right, do we have the right to decide whether someone is a Muslim or not, regardless of how they are characterizing themselves. Okay. Is this something, furthermore, that we are religiously required to do? So Gandhi elaborates on this point in his article on the counter-narrative, but also in another article which provides even more de uh, description, more detail, which is entitled Muslim and Non-Muslim. Right? And he raises the question of what should be done, the kind of specific question of what should be done in the case of people who are identified as Muslim, who are counted as Muslim and acknowledge themselves as Muslim, right? And yet they end up adopting a belief or particular behavior in a way that is neither approved by religious scholars, nor accepted as legitimate by 
the majority or the consensus of Muslims or the Muslim community? What is the status of these people? Right? So try to understand this. What he is attempting to address is the extent to which belief, creed, aqidah, ideas, actions, etc. that are engaged in or adopted by individuals who identify as Muslim, are, they are identified as Muslim and identify as Muslim. Let's say, you know, the one point whatever mil billion Muslims that exist in the world that we say, hey, this is the population Muslim. Within that, there are going to be many people who we might identify as being deviant in their actions or more importantly or, or sort of more evidently in certain beliefs that they hold. What is their status? What is the status of these people is the question that Ramdi is raising. Right? And what he is basically saying is, from the standpoint of Islam's sources from the Quran and Sunnah, what we can determine is that you can say that these people are wrong in what they have believed. You can say that they have deviated from the correct path. You can note the problems that exist in what they are putting forward as a legitimate belief in Islam or a creed within Islam. But what you cannot do is you cannot remove them from the community. And he says the reason why is because these people, these folks who you are categorizing as deviant, they are formulating their arguments on the basis of the Quran on the basis of the Sunnah, right? however they sort of understand those things, but they're basing that, they're, that they have adopted a methodology of proof with regard to something being religious within the faith of Islam. They've adopted the methodology that is premised upon Islam's core sources, which is the methodology that all groups within the Muslim community at the base level, begin with. And in that sense then are affirming their connection to the community and the fact that they are a part of it. You can hold a harsh opinion of them. You can have a severe opinion of them, but you cannot remove them from the community. No one has the right to expel them from the community because of the fact they are actually affirming. They're affirming their, their inclusion within the community by the way in which they are putting forward proof for their positions, for their views, for their particular beliefs. What he is essentially saying is that this is an interpretive difference. And it might be a absolutely crazy, outlier, deviant, out there opinion, and you can label it as such. You can say this is absolutely absurd as an interpretation, but you cannot use that then as a basis to unilaterally decide to remove them from the community. And people might say, well, listen, what do you think, what do you think God's judgment would be on these people? How do you think God would think of these views that these people have that are so out there, that don't even make sense as interpretations? And Ramdi says that is something we have to reserve and wait till the day of judgment to find out. Because we simply do not have the knowledge to make this type of determination as to what God's judgment would be. We don't know what God's judgment would be. We don't have access to God's will in that way. In essence, for Ramdi, these are two sides that are disagreeing with what 
with regard to what the Quran means or is saying on a particular issue. And we are not equipped, truly equipped, to conclusively resolve this debate. In order to do that, someone would need to have divine authority, and no one can claim this authority. According to Gandhi, no one can claim this authority. There's no other route to arrive at God's judgment than to simply wait for it. The last person to have the authority to pronounce on God's judgment, prophet peace be upon him, and he is no longer around, and as a result, we have to wait. We have to wait till the day of judgment. So, what Ramdi essentially then says is that people who might be accused of having deviant beliefs or deviant behavior, but who affirm themselves as Muslim, in this world, we must consider them Muslim. They must be considered Muslim. They must be treated as Muslim. They are, in fact, Muslim. You don't even have a right to not consider them Muslim based on whatever laws you create within your society, whatever social conventions you are going to apply to other Muslims, you have to apply to these folks as well. You have to deal with them the way you do with other Muslims. If they pass away, they are entitled to the same obligations from you as it relates to their funeral rites, the janaza prayer that's going to be prayed upon them, the manner in which they will be shrouded and buried will be consistent with what happens with other Muslims that they are a part of the community and are entitled to all the obligations that are owed to other members of the community at the time of passing, right? Similarly, with regard to marriage, with regard to divorce, the rules as it relates to other Muslims will apply to them. You may make a personal choice not to marry them or have a family member marry them. But you cannot decree a law that prohibits anyone from doing that, from marrying these people, simply because you have determined that their beliefs are deviant. Right? You can make personal decisions here, but you cannot legislate against it. So religious scholars have the right to point out this group's mistakes, to encourage them to accept a correct path. They should meet with them, Ramdi Saab says. They should talk to them. If there's anything in the ideas of these people that is approaching shirk or kufr, then they should point that out, right? These scholars can tell others of the wrongs of this group, right? You can inform society that, hey, this group here, their beliefs are totally illegitimate. You can do that. You can explain the extent of wrongfulness and deviance within the belief that certain groups within the Muslim community have. However, no one has the right. No one has the right to decide, not even scholars, not even religious scholars, no one has the right to say that these people are no longer Muslim and must be excommunicated from the community, according to Ghamdi. Ghamdi is pointing out here something important. He's saying that it is not simply that the choice is between either remaining silent when people are pursuing deviant ideas, deviant beliefs, deviant behavior, or excommunication. That those aren't the only two options, right? It's not simply be quiet, I'm okay, you're okay, regardless of what you're doing. No, it's okay to dispute, he says. It's okay to point out the wrong, right? It's okay to invite people to correct themselves. If someone, for instance, is taking towards superstitions, or if someone is getting involved with intoxications, this should be pointed out. 
an attempt should be made to correct these folks. But as you bring the truth forward to them, you present evidence to them. In fact, this is a duty of yours to do that. It's an obligation upon you to make the truth known. You cannot know that something is shirk and not point that out and say nothing. But obviously, when you say it, he says you have to say it with, with a tenderness, with a politeness, with, with a goal of effectuating change, not simply indicating your superiority to somebody else because of the knowledge that you have or simply wanting to put someone down. No, you're going to convey the truth in a manner that is fitting, right? That will accomplish the end that you seek, which is that this other person, this, this other group, tunes into the ideas you're putting forward. All right, so bringing the truth forward is important. It's necessary, but you cannot just decide someone's faith. You cannot just decide that you wish to excommunicate somebody because they have superstitious beliefs, because they're engaged in, in partaking in intoxication. Why? Because you simply do not have the right to do this, Ramdi Sab says. If you had the right to do this, God would have given it to you. God has not given it to you. God can do this. A prophet can do this through God's power. But no one else has been given this right. Whatever you want to say is a right that you have. Right? If you want to say, no, absolutely, I have this right. I have this authority. God has given me this authority. Then you must put forward the proof for that. And that proof must come from the sources of Islam. And in Ramdi's view, no such proof exists. Classifying somebody as a non-Muslim, right? Revealing that they don't believe in Islam. And that's fine, right? They could be a Christian, could be an atheist. It's not meant pejoratively, not meant as an insult, just a factual statement, a description of fact, similar to whether someone is an American versus not American. Right? Or non-American. However, we oftentimes use the label of kafir to describe a non-Muslim. And this, Gandhi says, this is something that requires us to be more careful. And in the next session, I'm going to explore this idea further in Gandhi's thought with regard to the idea or the notion of who is a kafir. So up to this point, what Ramdi is putting forward is, hey, we cannot ex excommunicate people from within the Muslim community. We cannot excommunicate them simply because of deviant belief or deviant behavior if they themselves are acknowledging that they are Muslim and that they are putting forth proof for these deviant ideas from within the Quran and Sunnah. It may not be good proof, but that that is the method they're using. But as part of his fourth point, the other component is this discussion of who is or what is the idea of a kafir, a disbeliever, and how that plays into this debate. And we'll pick that up in our next session. <laughs> وقولك لهذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وسائر المسلمين وقولي قولي